Hello everybody, it's Shrouded Hand here. So I think I've mentioned this on previous videos that I suffer from insomnia quite a lot and one of the things I, that helps me is listening to YouTube videos and podcasts. Maybe I could do a video to help out people who maybe can't get to sleep as well. One of the things I collect is books of ghost stories and I've got such a huge collection I don't really know what to do with. So I thought it would be fun to just read out some of these stories. So this will be a kind of long form video. The image will be completely blank. Half these stories I've not read before. Uh, I don't know whether they're going to be any good. Hopefully they're kind of interesting. I'm going to pick a variety of different books. Yeah, get comfortable. And uh, hope you enjoy the stories. This one comes from a book called Ghosts, edited by Morven Eldritch. Sonia Forche was a diabetic, and her condition required that she inject insulin at precisely the same times each and every day. The first injection was to be made at exactly 8 o'clock in the morning. While touring one of the Canadian national parks with her parents, she stayed in a hotel in southern Alberta. She asked for an early morning call and breakfast at 8 o'clock. All went well for several mornings. First she received the telephone call and about five minutes later she would find her breakfast tray left outside her door. One morning however she received the telephone call as usual but on this occasion there was no breakfast. Thinking that they were just a little late she took a quick shower gave herself the injection and again went to collect her breakfast, but still there was nothing there. She assumed that the staff had forgotten to bring her breakfast up and so decided to have it in the dining room with her parents. However, when she knocked on the door to see if they were ready to go down, her father was rather short with her and asked if she knew what time it was. Instead of being just after eight o'clock, it was five. Sonia protested that it must be 8 o'clock as she had just received an early morning call, but when she checked her watch she discovered that her father was correct. In the morning when the family complained to the desk clerk, he told them that they must have been mistaken since the desk was not staffed until 8 and the telephones were, in any case, turned off all night. As the clerk was trying to mollify the family, he suddenly realised that Sonia was staying in room 6. He explained that guests in this room were occasionally disturbed by the ghost of a desk clerk who had died in harness some years before. He then invited Sonia to place her observations in the book he produced. Within she found the recollections of several other guests who had had the misfortune of being in receipt of the ghost clerk's attentions. This one comes from the book titled Ghosts Over Britain by Peter Moss. The Tenement of Terror. It is a popular jibe that a ghost is a good ally for council tenants who want to change their house or for private tenants who want a reduction in rent. But when two nurses run out of an ideal flat in the early hours of the morning and refuse to sleep there ever again, even though they have no alternative accommodation, we must look further than mere whim or convenience for the source of their behaviour. In the autumn of 1974, Shirley Brown came from her home in Orkney to be a student at the Dundee Hospital and after about six months she was fortunate enough to find a small flat in a tenement in Morgan Street. Here she shared a living room kitchen, bathroom and bedroom with fellow student Gail Bruce and for a year life seemed idyllic. Both girls enjoyed their work and studies, got on extremely well with each other, were free to run their own lives and for Shirley at least, a mainland city was still exciting. Then in January 1976, something went seriously wrong. One morning, Shirley, who was not to be on duty until 1pm, did not waken until Gail was about to leave for the morning shift and found her flatmate looking at her with a very strange expression. Gail asked whether Shirley felt alright and scarcely waiting for the affirmative answer said that she would explain at lunchtime. 
Over the midday meal, Gail said that she had been unable to sleep the night before for no obvious reason. Shirley herself had last looked at her watch at 2.30, but neither of them realised that the other was awake, when at about 3.30 as near as she could guess, the light suddenly snapped on. Immediately afterwards she had heard someone moving about in the bathroom with slow padding steps and, not unnaturally, she was terrified, although logically she knew that the door was locked and no one could possibly get in. Gail dived beneath the bedclothes, but after a few minutes her natural curiosity got the better of her and she emerged. The hall was now in darkness again. But with a numbing sensation compounded of surprise and fear, she saw standing beside Shirley's bed what she took to be a normal elderly woman with short grey hair and dressed in a pale blue nightgown or long dress. The stranger and Shirley were apparently deep in conversation in sibilant whispers, and though Gail could not make out any actual words, there seemed to be an overwhelming impression of evil and menace in the secretive muttering. Momentarily she closed her eyes, then reopened them and found the figure had gone. Petrified and uncomprehending, she lay tensed in the darkness until, rather prematurely, she got up for duty. Both girls were now very frightened by the incident and decided that they would never be in the flat alone again. One evening a week later, however, just as their fears were beginning to subside and the tension to relax, Shirley was lying in bed just before midnight, reading as she waited for Gail to finish in the bathroom. Gradually she became aware to the steady increasing pounding of her heart that someone was moving stealthily about the kitchen. Immediately the tide of fear flooded back and simultaneously she thought she could hear Gail still in the bathroom. Apprehensively she tapped the wall that divided the bedroom from the kitchen, knowing that if Gail were in there she would tap back. But instead of a reassuring, gentle, feminine knock, there came a terrible outburst, as if someone with superhuman strength and steel talons were trying to claw a way through the brickwork. Frantically Shirley called for Gail, who dashed in from the bathroom, and at once the terrifying sounds fell to a silence that were almost as frightening. The two girls sat on the bed struggling to hold at bay the panic that threatened to engulf them, when there came again the savage clawing at the wall, this time with increased ferocity, as if the being on the other side was determined to smash through. For over a quarter of an hour the frenzied battering and tearing continued until without warning their nerves snapped and pulling on a few clothes they prepared to dash from the building, although it was now almost 1am. The instant they were ready, they realised with horror that their keys were in the living room, which was now occupied by something dreadful. But not wishing to stay where they were, they plucked up every atom of courage they possessed, raced into the hall and flicked on the electric light in the living room. There was instantly a brilliant blue flash, and the bulb fused. This may have been sheer coincidence, but the darkness didn't make the perilous dash across the room to the table any less terrifying. They spent the rest of the night in a flat of their friends. Neither of them dared to spend another night in their own flat, though they did go back in daylight hours to collect their belongings. They noticed that the wall, in spite of the frenzied clawing they had heard, had not the slightest mark on it. Although both felt that they should try to find out more of the history of the flat, if only for their own peace of mind and to get some idea of what might be behind the haunting, their nerves would not let them, lest they turned up something more dreadful than they had anticipated. In the peace of the new rooms they found a week later, they were only too glad to let the terror of those two nights gradually fade from the forefront of their minds. This one comes from a book titled Northumberland Stories of the Supernatural by Michael J. Hallowell. It's titled The Villagers Lost in Time. Some time ago, whilst shopping in Newcastle's Chinatown, 
a reader of one of my columns espied my wife and gingerly approached. After introducing herself, she said that she'd been meaning to write for me for some time with the question, but had always ended up binning her efforts halfway through, on the basis that I might have thought she was silly. I'm not sure why, as her question was a perfectly sensible one. I asked the reader, beauty therapist Edie Bouchard, just what her question was. To tell the truth, I used to think that time was sort of in a line, you know, past, present and future. But then I read about a woman who said she'd got lost in Berlin one day, turned a corner and ended up in the year 1917. She claimed she'd gone back through time. I know it sounds daft, but I keep worrying that the same thing could happen to me. It's become an obsession really. Now just because time travel isn't possible as far as we know, that doesn't mean that people can't get a glimpse of the past, which is an entirely different thing. The truth is that looking into the past is as easy as falling off a log, it costs no money and you can, if you wish, do it this very night. Open your door after dark and look up into the night sky. You'll see an uncountable number of stars. Each one of those stars is light years away from planet Earth. Some are only five or six light years away, other hundreds. When we look at a star, which is say 20 light years away, we're seeing it not as it is now, but as it was 20 years ago. It's taken the light 20 years to reach us. Just by looking at that one star, we're literally looking back 20 years into the past. Therefore it becomes self-evident that when we stare at dozens of stars, we're actually looking back through the years at many different time periods at once. Several years ago I interviewed a couple who had visited Northumberland two summers previously. They'd booked into a and b in Annick and spent a lazy few days meandering around our breathtaking countryside. Lunches were taken in picturesque pubs and afternoons spent exploring castles and stately homes. They couldn't have been happier. One day after picking up several bits and pieces at a car boot sale, they decided to head back to their digs before visiting a nearby pub for a nightcap. On the way they happened to spot a cottage at the side of the road. It wasn't in the best condition. It was somewhat ramshackle to be honest, but they both agreed it was possessed by a large degree of charm. Linda Williams told me it reminded her of the sort of thing one would find featuring in a Catherine Cookson novel. Her husband Boris agreed. It really was enchanting. It was picture postcard perfect, they said. Linda, who was driving, pulled into a makeshift lay-by on the side of the road and retrieved her camera from the back seat of the car. She stepped out and quickly took two pictures of the cottage. Slightly apprehensive that someone might see her and wonder what on earth she was up to, the couple then resumed their journey. Two or three days passed by and after another busy morning motoring, Linda and Boris found themselves driving not too far away from the cottage that had enchanted them so much. They decided to make a slight detour and take another look. To their surprise they didn't find any cottage when they turned the corner. Instead they were confronted by something altogether different. A working post office. It was quaint and picturesque but of a distinctly more modern provenance. Naturally they assumed that they'd taken a wrong turning but then Linda spotted something. Across the road from the post office was the lay-by they'd parked in several days earlier. There was no doubt in my mind that it was the same lay-by, she said. There was a litter bin on a wooden post and a large boulder painted white. Boris was convinced there had to be a rational explanation and so was I. The couple stood talking for a while but simply couldn't come up with an answer that made any sense. Finally they decided to pop into the post office to see if anyone inside could shed some light on the matter. The postmaster wasn't in, but an elderly woman was serving behind the shop counter. She said she couldn't be sure, but she believed that there used to be a cottage on the site where the post office now stood. She didn't know when it had been demolished, and as it had already disappeared from the landscape when she was a child, she had no recollection of what it had looked like. Linda and Boris eventually returned home, 
and one of the first things they did was to get their photographs developed. I honestly didn't think the picture of the cottage would come out, said Boris. I just had this feeling that it would be blank or something, and we wouldn't have any proof that we'd seen it. But the picture did come out. It wasn't perfect. The colours were faded almost to the point where it almost appeared to be monochrome, and the right-hand side was faded to white. Still, the cottage could be seen clearly, exactly as they remembered it. When I first covered the story, I was interested to see whether there were any background features, hills, mounds, roadways, that could be used to positively identify the location as being exactly the same as the one where the post office now stood. Sadly, there weren't any. I wanted to visit myself and talk to the postmaster, but Linda didn't feel comfortable about that. They'd telephoned the postmaster, she said, and hadn't received an enthusiastic response. He didn't want his business labelled as a haunted building, she told me, and was really concerned that the newspapers would start making a song and dance about it. We talked about it and decided not to take it any further. We didn't want such an incredible story to end on a sour note. We still have our picture, and that's enough, I suppose. The couple did make one or two further inquiries, discreet ones. I managed to establish that the cottage on the site had been demolished in 1926. As for Edie Bouchard, there wasn't much I could say to comfort her, except that a number of people who claim to have experienced time travel are very few indeed. The strange experience related to me by Linda and Boris Williams wasn't the only one of its kind to have taken place in Northumberland. In 1946, Linda Craig from Liverpool came on a visit with her grandparents for a week's holiday. It wasn't long before she became bored with the country cottage where they were staying and decided to do some exploring, as she puts it. Linda couldn't remember the name of the village where she stayed, but she did recall that there were three shops there, a general dealer's, a post office and a small dairy outlet next to a nearby farm. Curious, she visited each shop in turn. She didn't purchase anything, just looked at the goods on the shelves and then moved on. She particularly liked the shop attached to the dairy and recalled talking at length with an elderly woman behind the counter. She gave me a glass of milk, the best I've ever tasted, she said. The following day, Linda walked along the same lane again, fully intending to visit the dairy a second time in the hope of getting yet another glass of milk, but she couldn't find it. The dairy, along with the adjacent shop, were nowhere to be seen. Puzzled, she returned to the holiday cottage and asked her grandmother where the dairy shop was. Her grandmother, also puzzled, told her that the old dairy had been demolished during the First World War. I discussed the case with a colleague and we both realised that the grandmother must have had some sort of connection with the village, otherwise how could she have known the fate of the old dairy all those years ago? We weren't sure what sort of influence this might have had on Linda's experience, if any, unless one accepts the controversial theory of genetically inherited memory. Had Linda recalled something that her grandmother had actually experienced decades earlier? We can but guess. Had she travelled back in time? It's tempting to believe so, but too much water has passed under that temporal bridge by now. All we can do is marvel at a truly mysterious tale. This story comes from a book titled True Ghost Stories from Around the World, Volume 2. The story is titled Whose Hand Holds Mine by Lady M. S. Lawford. I fell asleep alone in a locked room, and awoke in the dawn to the distinct feeling that someone was holding my hand. The day before I had moved into a new house and had chosen the largest and what I judged to be the coolest bedroom, as the normal temperature for a midsummer's night in the northwest frontier of India was around 116 degrees. It was a stiflingly hot night. There was not a breath of air. Only now and then I heard the drone of a mosquito. I took a shower, poured myself some ice water and eventually fell asleep. I awoke slowly and naturally. My arms were flung above my head. 
I was aware that a cool, strong hand was clasping mine. My husband? Had he returned unexpectedly? No. In the early morning light, I looked at my right hand and could see no other hand. Still, I felt a distinctly cool, firm grip. Sitting up in bed, I rubbed my hand, telling myself that it must have been some trick of circulation. Then slowly, as if loath to let go, the feeling of the hand clasp faded away. Wide awake now and more than a little uneasy, I sprang out of bed. Although it was only five o'clock, I ordered coffee and my horse. At the same time, I gave orders for my bed and belongings to be moved into another room. As I rode through the woods in that cool dawn, I pondered over the happenings of the night. Certainly it hadn't been a dream. After breakfast, I wrote my experience to my husband, General Sir Sidney Lawford, who was away inspecting troops in another part of India. I was tempted to join him, but it felt stupid to run away from an intangible sensation. The same afternoon, while we were walking the dogs, I met a very old woman. She was almost bent double as she moved about gathering wood and berries which were probably to be her evening meal. After talking with her for a few moments, I held out some silver and asked her if she knew any stories about the village. That house, I said, indicating the one I had just rented. What was in it before the white sahibs came there? That is a sad house, she answered. There is no evil in it only a happy sadness. Tell me more, I requested, giving her some more small change. After tying the money in her rags, she told me this story. Years before the present house was built, the residents of a very rich Indian merchant had stood in the same place. This merchant had one lovely daughter who fell in love with a penniless young man who was good and kind. However, the merchant would have none of this and arranged to marry his lovely child to a man almost as old as himself, a wealthy man who already had two other wives. The girl cried and protested in vain, and when it became clear that there was no alternative, since the girl's wedding was to take place the next day, the two young lovers poisoned themselves. Their bodies were found on the morning of their scheduled wedding, dead on the floor of her bedroom, hand in hand. This experience of mine occurred many years ago in India, when nothing of that sort had ever happened to me before. The memory of the incident would still be fresh in my mind, even if it wasn't for the fact that sometimes I still wake up with the feeling of a cool, strong hand gripping mine. This one comes from a book titled Scottish Ghosts. Ben McDewey in the Cairngorms is a magnificent but lonely place to experience a ghost. Upper slopes of the mountain have snow on them for several months of the year and make an awesome sight, but even in summer the landscape possesses a certain power. The mountain is one of Scotland's Munros, hills over 3,000 feet high and is popular with walkers and climbers, but in spite of this is still very isolated. It's quite possible for the solitary walker to spend several hours on the mountain without coming into contact with any other human being. On occasion, lone walkers have found that they have company after all. Not human company, but that of the Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey. Sights and sounds of the Big Grey Man have been reported for more than a century now by several people. The ghost is not only seen on the mountain, but also in the surrounding area of the Cairngorms. Several common elements link the stories that have been told by various witnesses. One of the first reported experiences was that of Professor Norman Colley from London. He was climbing back down from the summit in 1891 when he heard something behind him in the mist. It sounded as if something or someone was following him down the mountain, taking one step for every three or four of his. Professor Colley was unable to make out anything in particular as the visibility was very poor, but he was sufficiently frightened to take flight, preferring to risk a fall rather than to be caught by his pursuer. 
Other witnesses in the years that have followed have told stories that have strikingly common elements about them. Often the first thing that witnesses notice is the sound of footsteps. The footsteps are heavy and slower than those of the walker. This leads the witness to conclude that what he or she is hearing is probably a very large person. Sometimes this is all that the witness has experienced. Other witnesses, however, have also seen something, generally a very large upright figure in the distance. People who have seen the figure and tried to follow it have seen no trace of footprints. The descriptions of the figure vary slightly, but is usually described as being grey, very tall and human in form, but somehow not quite right, unnatural. In 1943, a man called Alexander Tunian was on the Ben McDewey. He was a naturalist with considerable experience in the mountains. As he climbed, he became aware of the sound of heavy, slow footsteps. After a while, a large figure rushed at him out of the mist. Tunian shot at the shape three times, but it seemed neither to hurt it or to scare it off. He turned and fled and eventually managed to shake off this sinister follower. The figure on Ben McDewey, whoever or whatever it might be, certainly seems to be a malign presence and its manifestations have succeeded in inspiring great fear in even the most hardened mountaineers. This one comes from a book titled Ghosts and Legends of Northumbria. The story is titled South Shields Ghosts. Although many of our tales feature hauntings of famous historic castles and houses, there have been just as many incidences in the homes of ordinary folk as the following events from South Shields illustrate. The Old Hall in West Holborn, once the residence of a wealthy ship owner, was later let out as flats or tenements. A lady lived there for quite some time, and she and her family heard and saw many strange things, including the mark of two bloody fingers and a thumb on one of their mantelpieces. No amount of cleaning with any substance would remove the marks, they even reappeared through several coats of paint and were regarded as the stains of murder, which were thought to be indelible. One night, as the lady lay reading, unable to sleep. The figure of a tall, handsome lady in a white dress with a scarlet waistband glided across the room. She came from a door which was permanently out of use and crossed towards the window on the opposite wall, then vanished. Beneath the windowsill where the apparition had disappeared was a small hole caused by a knot falling out of the wood, down which small articles were continuously falling. A member of the family hooked out various items, several dead beetles and other insects which may have infested graves. Later, the lady of the house said she wished she had removed the sill for closer inspection. Other incidents also took place, including the apparition of a soldier who was sometimes seen on the first floor landing. There was also one apartment in the house which was never entered, as it was believed to be the favourite haunt of supernatural beings. No tenant would rent the flat. Although there was no glass in the windows, the door remained firmly closed. What was in it beside ghosts, nobody knew or dared to investigate. Even to peep in through the keyhole would have needed more courage than most people possess. Occasionally strange noises were heard from behind the door and many pondered what terrible murders or similar dreadful deeds had taken place there. Perhaps a hidden treasure lay under the floor, with the mouldering bones of a murdered man. In another house in Thrift Street, a servant girl was amazed to see an ancient lady as she went down to the cellar one dark evening. The lady asked her to return the following night, but without the candle, and she would hear something to her advantage. Venturing into the cellar the next evening, the girl decided to take the candle for safety, but the old lady informed her that if she had not brought the light, she would have told her such a tale. The ghostly figure did agree to give the girl something for having had the courtesy to return that night. 
Having been instructed to put her hand into a particular crack in the wall, the girl found the deeds to the house and a purse full of money. It was not known what became of the deeds, but the girl kept the money, left her job and became a grand lady for the rest of her life. Jack the Hammer was a well-known personality in South Shields around the 19th century. He was a tall, good-looking old man with a slight stoop, white hair, a Roman nose and high forehead. During his life he travelled around the countryside, mending pots and pans, leading a fairly ordinary life. Jack died as he had lived, alone, and his body lay for some time before neighbours broke down the door of his house and discovered him. It was unlikely that Jack had any hidden treasure, or even a guilty secret, but his spirit was not allowed to rest peacefully. His ghost appeared, usually during a gale when someone was lost at sea, and it would strike a hammer at the end of his house using tremendous power. It was some time before anyone would live in the old man's house, but eventually a man who was completely unafraid of ghosts was chosen by the landlord to clear the house's bad name. A family rented a house in Stevenson Street, South Shields for a year, and were said to witness strange events. Shortly after moving into the house, the family were aware of weird disturbances which were both puzzling and frightening. The patter of feet would be heard in a passage on the ground floor, but on investigation there was no one to be seen. The sounds were heard both day and night in all parts of the house. Sleep was impossible in the lady's bedroom due to the incessant sound of a child's rattle which would circle the bed and could even be heard in the bed curtains. The rattle would seem to be close to her head, first on one side and then on the other and then tiny feet would patter and run around the bed, accompanied by the sound of a child's cry or a woman sobbing. The most distressing experience happened when the master of the house was away at sea. His wife took their small son to bed with her, fearful for his safety, when suddenly an inhuman voice was heard crying, weep, 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 followed by gasps of breath, and then again, weep, 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 a struggling for breath and the same cry repeated a third time. Approaching the place where the sounds had come from, the mother and her terrified son clutching at her hand asked several times what was wrong. The voices, obviously those of a sobbing child and distressed woman, were terrifying and heartrending. After a few days, the lady decided to summon her courage and challenge the ghosts. As she called out for the intruders to reveal their identity, or to cease disturbing the family, the sounds immediately stopped. The ghosts revealed themselves only twice. Firstly, the clear figure of a child fell from the ceiling and vanished into the floor. And secondly, a child was seen running into a cupboard in a room at the top of the house. No matter how often the cupboard door was closed, it would open itself, even before the lady left the room. This particular place became the centre of the hauntings and the sounds of creaking shoes pacing back and forth were heard day and night. After a year the family were thankful to be leaving the house. Five or six years later a new buyer was carrying out alterations and the skeleton of a child was discovered under the floorboards close to that cupboard door. Some years before, the house had been occupied by a disagreeable man who was on intimate terms with his female servant. Local people drew their own conclusions from this, and it may be assumed that at one time a child died tragically in what was thought to be an ordinary house. This one comes from a book titled The Ghost Files by Jeff Bellinger. I've only told a few people this story, but everyone in my family and a few friends have all experienced this. My family has endured a lot of tragedy and death, but our strong bonds have kept those departed from our family very, very close. My grandfather's house is a depository of every family member that has passed, with the dominant entity being my grandmother. It started when my aunt Gloria passed away when she was 15 years old. 
I was six years old at the time, and after the funeral they turned a small wall in the house into a type of shrine. I remember my grandparents looking at the picture every night and going through her items, including locks of her hair. As young as I was, I remember smelling her in the house. After a while it got to where everyone would just say hello to the picture when they came in. My grandmother passed away next, and that was when things really started to kick in. I was 18 at the time, and I was living with my grandparents to help my grandpa take care of grandma. She was very ill, and the last time she left the house to go to the hospital, she told me she wouldn't be back and to take care of things. She was right. A few months after she passed, I let a friend from work spend the night. She slept on the couch downstairs. I came down the next morning, and she was drinking a cup of coffee. She said that she found it perked her already, and asked who the lady with red hair was. I didn't put two and two together until much later. My friend said she was wearing a white uniform, and she was in the kitchen when she woke up. Well, I thought maybe one of her old nurses had come by, perhaps to pick up some equipment. I went into the kitchen, and all of the cupboards were open. I didn't think anything about it, I just closed them. I took my friend down into the cellar, and she pointed out the picture of a woman and said, that's the lady right there. She had pointed to a picture of my grandmother on her wedding day. I kind of flipped out a bit and told her that the picture was almost 40 years old and that she'd passed on. I could see by the look on her face, she was sure that that was the woman. I talked with my grandfather that night, and he, a devout Roman Catholic, pointed out that grandma had been in the house. He talks to her all the time, and even now she still forgets the closed cupboard doors. My grandmother was a cook at a restaurant, and that was the white uniform my friend had saw her in. A few weeks later, my grandfather went out of town, and I had a party at the house. I invited a few friends and my cousin Michael. About two hours after the party started, Michael, who now owns this house, ran down the stairs, out the front door, got in his car and took off. He didn't even put on his shoes and it was the middle of winter. He called me when he got home and told me to go upstairs. I did and I was astonished to smell roses and funeral incense all over the upstairs, even though there were no flowers in the house. My guests also smelled it. It was unbelievably strong. As soon as I cleared out the house, it went away. She obviously didn't approve of my party. Several years went by, and then my mother passed away. Every time he went in the attic, her hope chest would be opened up. My grandfather remarried, but his second wife was very uncomfortable in the house. In fact, I moved away to Houston, and when I came back, the house had not been changed at all since my grandma passed away. When I commented to my grandfather that nothing had changed, he said, she won't let it. In succession, his two other daughters passed, a son-in-law passed, and then he passed, all in an eight-month time period. In fact, we had three family funerals in six weeks. This was in 2003. The day we buried my grandpa, his second wife hightailed out of the house and even left some of her clothes there. She said she knew the house didn't want her there, that it was always my grandmother's house. My cousin Michael bought the house, and he currently lives there. He says all kinds of things go on, and that his dog is always spooked. He'll never forget the day he ran out of the house. I go there all the time and I can feel everyone in there, and to this day, at least one of the cupboards is always open in the morning. My grandfather was the last to leave us and to enter into spiritual residence there, and he passed after he buried all of his daughters and his beloved wife there. The love and bonds that held them all together in life is still holding them together now in the house where we celebrated our family. I miss them all very much, but I feel like they are all there in the house. This story comes from a book titled Ghosts Go Haunting by Geoffrey Palmer and Noel Lloyd. Stories titled The Brown Lady. During the last 150 years, the Brown Lady of Raynham Park in Norfolk has been seen many times. 
She moved silently up and down the staircases and along the corridors, dressed in a gown of brown satin with yellow trimmings, and she has a ruff round her throat. Most of her features are clearly defined, but her eyes are dark and hollow, and her face has the whiteness of wax. Usually she is silent, harming nobody and wanting nothing. Sometimes, though, there is an evil and menacing quality about her haunting, and her appearance brings terror, even to the bravest of those who see her. Raynham is the home of the Marquis of Townsend. It is an ancient house which, in 1835, had recently been bought by the Townsends and had been renovated. The Lord and Lady Charles Townsend were hosts to a number of friends who had been invited to celebrate the completion of the alterations and to admire the decorations and new furniture. One of the guests was Captain Frederick Marriott, the famous author of boy stories, and soon after his arrival Lord Charles took him aside and led him to his study. He poured out some brandy for them both and said with a worried frown on his face, Frederick, there's something troubling me and I need your help. There's a rumour going round that there is a ghost in this house. I would dismiss the whole thing as nonsense, but the fact is neither guests nor servants stay more than a few nights. They keep seeing what they call the Brown Lady, a so-called ghost who walks about the house, along the corridors and in and out of the bedrooms. Now Charles, his friend chided him, you must not let such tales upset you. I, for one, do not believe in ghosts. If something is being seen, you can depend upon it that somebody is playing a trick on you. The house was empty for some time before you bought it and had the alterations done, wasn't it? Yes, he said. Being the magistrate of the county, Captain Marriott went on, I know that there is a good deal of smuggling and poaching round here. It might be that some of the stables and outhouses have been used as hiding places by these people when the house was empty. Now that it's inhabited, they resent your presence and are trying to drive you away by spreading tales in the village of ghosts and such nonsense. Lord Charles straightened up in his chair, a gleam in his eye. I believe you have hit on the answer, my dear Frederick. I keep dogs, as you know and their barking at night would be enough to upset the movements of anybody who wanted to get near the house or the outbuildings. They want to drive us away. Yes, that must be it. The brown lady is a figment of a poacher's imagination. Which room is the female visitor supposed to haunt? asked the captain flippantly, pleased that his common sense solution of the problem had appealed to his friend. It is a room on the first floor overlooking the stables, answered Lord Charles. A large, fine room panelled with cedar wood. There is a portrait on the wall of a woman who might be this brown lady that they talk about. She wears a brown and yellow dress and there is a ruff round her throat. Then, with your permission, I will sleep there, declared the captain. It will give me a chance to keep my eye on the stables, and also to deal with the ghost if she decides to turn up while I am there, which I doubt, he added with a chuckle. With pleasure, said Lord Charles. I will have the servants make up the bed. Like you, I don't think you will be troubled by a nocturnal visitor. For two nights, Captain Marriott slept in the haunted room, with a loaded revolver under his pillow, and saw nothing. The third night was the last of his stay, and he was convinced that that night would pass too without any incident. Just before midnight he stood in the bedroom with a candle in his hand and studied the portrait of the young woman in the brown silk dress. Her face was plain and present. The captain shook his head. Nothing there to give rise to talk of ghosts. He took a step backwards and the candle flame flickered. From that angle, with the light casting curious shadows, the face had changed. No longer was it simple and honest, but frightening and devilish. The eyes had sunk back into their sockets. The skin seemed to have shrunk on the bones. The captain could have sworn that he was looking at a skull. He moved again, and the original face reappeared. He gave a sigh of relief and put the candle down on the bedside table, then prepared to get ready for bed. 
He had undressed as far as his shirt and trousers when there was a knock at the door, and somehow he couldn't resist glancing at the portrait as he called, Come in. But it was not a ghost who entered, two nephews of Lord Charles, sharing a bedroom further down the corridor, stood in the doorway. Captain Marriott had met them earlier in the evening, and they had chatted about sporting dogs and guns. Ah, Captain, said one of the young men, I'm glad you're not in bed yet. Would you like to step over to our room and give your opinion on a new gun I bought in London? If you don't mind me as I am, the captain replied. He picked up the candle and moved towards the door. The skull in the portrait seemed to grin down at him and he hesitated. Then, with a shamefaced laugh, he picked up the revolver. I'll bring this with me, in case we meet the brown lady. He would not admit, even to himself, that he didn't know whether he was joking or not. The three men went down the corridor to the other bedroom. The captain was shown the gun and admired it declaring that he would get one like it the next time he was in London. They talked for a few more minutes, then the captain yawned. Now I must go to bed, he declared. I have a long journey tomorrow. We'd better see you back to your room, one of the nephews laughed, in case you're kidnapped by the brown lady. They left the bedroom together and started off down the long, gloomy corridor. The whole house was in darkness and only their footsteps broke the silence. They had only gone a few yards, however, when the captain halted abruptly. Look, he said in a cracked whisper. Moving towards him from the other end of the corridor was a figure carrying a lamp. It was a woman wearing a dress which rustled as she walked. Her features were in shadow. It must be one of the lady guests who's got lost on her way, Marriott muttered, or someone who's going to visit the nurseries. I wonder who it can be, one of the nephews questioned, for I don't recognise her as one of the guests. The figure came steadily towards him. The temperature dropped suddenly, as though the world had turned to winter, and the men shivered involuntarily. The captain, suddenly conscious that he was not properly dressed for a lady to see him, dived into the open door of an unoccupied room, pulling the young men in after him. He closed the door so that there was only an inch wide opening and they cowered behind it, eyes to the crack, their hearts beating strangely fast. The apparition was almost up to the door now and Captain Marriott, watching intently, saw how the light from the lamp brought her features into focus and showed the brown colour of her silken dress. It was the lady of the portrait and she was walking slowly down the corridor, her dress rustling, but her feet making no sound on the polished wooden floor. Her eyes shone in the lamplight, and the expression on her plain face was untroubled. When she was directly opposite the door, she stopped. She put the lamp before her face, and as she did so, her features changed. The bones beneath the flesh showed through, as though a skeleton crouched there. The eyes disappeared into deep caves of evil. The lipless mouth was like the opening of a grave. Slowly the door swung open, and the brown lady, with her hideous face, stood fully revealed before them. With an effort, the captain wrenched his thoughts into a channel of action. He put up his revolver and fired point-blank at the ghost. The noise in that confined space was deafening. When the smoke had cleared away, the captain looked down at the floor, expecting to see a body collapsed and bleeding, but there was nothing there, not even the faintest sign that anything could have been there. The corridor was empty, except for the three men and the drifting smoke. Bewildered, they looked at each other. There was something there, wasn't there? asked the captain. My eyes weren't playing tricks. One of the young men shuddered. If you saw what I saw, it was horrible. He pointed to the door opposite. Look, he said, there's the bullet hole. The bullet went straight through whatever it was. The captain said soberly, no smuggler or poacher could have arranged what we saw. The brown lady of Raynham, the picture that came to life. A sudden thought struck him. Come with me, he said to the others, come to my room. They followed him somewhat fearfully. The captain hurried to the wall on which the portrait hung. He lifted the candle high. The brown lady stared down at him, her face peaceful and ordinary. 
The brown dress glittered where the light caught its shiny folds. The captain caught his breath sharply. Was it his imagination, or was there something different in the region of the heart? Was that a thin trickle of blood, gleaming moistly? Okay, that's the last story. And if you're not asleep already, or if you're just listening to enjoy the stories, then I hope you liked that. So, uh, thanks for watching. Sweet dreams. Until next time. Goodbye.